Non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer is prostate cancer that is no longer responding to hormone therapy, but the patient does not have metastasis. Stepping back a little bit, let's first talk about castrate resistant prostate cancer or CRPC, which we used to refer to as hormone refractory prostate cancer. It's basically a gentleman in our practice who has been on hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy and now has a rising PSA or clinical progression of the disease. He also has to have an, a low testosterone level, either less than 50, classically less than 50 or even less than 20, and his PSA has to be rising. This has been a frustration because non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer uh, doesn't really have any current FDA approved treatments. And so we have this condition of men with a rising PSA on androgen deprivation therapy. The men are very concerned about their rising PSA. In general, most of them would like something done. And yet we have this black box right now remaining in 2017 where we don't have any FDA approved drugs specifically for this condition. Now, on the other hand, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer or M1 CRPC has been in the news for the last 10 years. Since 2010, we've had a number of treatments or multiple treatments approved for men who have metastatic disease, but for this M0 or non-metastatic group of patients, traditionally up until now, we just haven't had any new treatments to offer those gentlemen. Non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer is common, although it's not crystal clear how common it is. Uh, I did some recent literature searches trying to answer that question. One European paper I found said that in the European Union, potentially four to seven percent of prostate cancer patients that are living would have non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Then I looked at data from the United States and recently the American Cancer Society suggests that there may be 20 some million or tw up to 29 million men, which seems crazy high, living in the United States who are survivors of prostate cancer. If you combine the, you know, multiply out that, the 3 to 7 percent or the 4 to 7 percent, you could have anywhere from a half a million to over two million men in the United States who theoretically could have non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. In, in my own practice or in my experience as a clinician, I would personally estimate that there probably are a half a million men in the United States who have this non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And up until recently, you would have said, well, who cares how many there are because we really don't have any treatments for it. But as of now, there are some treatments coming down, to the, down the pike. And again, we could be looking to identify up to a half million men where we would like to uh, uh, you know, determine if they're eligible for some of these new treatments that may be coming online. When we have a patient who has M0 CRPC, the first thing we need to do with that patient is determine how risky his condition is, meaning how likely is his cancer to progress to metastatic disease and how long will that take. And what it is appearing from the literature is that a key factor is PSA doubling time and absolute PSA. The clinical trials testing some of these new agents like enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide all used a PSA doubling time of 10 months or less along with a PSA typically in the 2 to 5 range. In plain English, when we have these M0 patients, it may be appropriate to follow patients for a while, monitor a series of PSAs, go to the internet, go to Google and do a PSA doubling time calculator, punch those PSAs and dates and try to get a sense on what that PSA doubling time is. And if the PSA doubling time in that patient is still greater than 10 months, you might be able just to monitor that patient with further active surveillance. 
but the red flag seems to be when that PSA doubling time falls below 10 months, that's a harbinger of more severe disease and may be a trigger point for us to consider these novel hormonal therapy agents once they become FDA approved. So when a doctor is in his clinic, uh, let's just take an example of a patient. So a patient has prostate cancer, gets treatment with localized, for localized disease with surgery or radiation. Later, some of those patients develop a recurrence and then have a rising PSA level. At some point, the patient gets nervous, the doctor gets nervous, and those men are put on traditional hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy. And for most of them, they go on for a period of years or maybe multiple years when they're doing fine. Then they have a rising PSA again while they're on this hormone therapy and have a castrate testosterone level, and that's the first sign of this non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. The challenge is, is we're not sure when and how often to image them to look for metastatic disease. And so many times there's a, a delay in recognition of this condition and a delay in treatment. The delay in treatment is understandable because again, as of the current point in time in late 2017, we have no FDA approved treatments. But once we have FDA approved treatments, it'll be more critical for doctors to identify these M0 patients, talk to them, counsel them about available treatments, and in many cases, if there's effective treatments available, start those treatments.